Russia and China seek a trade advantage in the Arctic. Once impossible to navigate, an easing Northeast Passage could provide an alternative to routes in the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. As global warming reduces pack ice and lengthens the summer season, will Beijing and Moscow build a polar Silk Road? I'm Andrea Sankey, and this is the Newsmakers. An easy maritime route between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans has long been a dream for countries surrounding the Arctic Circle, especially for Russia. But miserable conditions during much of the year mean the Northeast Passage connecting East Asia to Europe has never become a major commercial shipping route. That could be about to change. Russia and China are looking to increase cooperation to make the passage viable. Global warming is helping, but so could an upgraded fleet of Russian-made nuclear-powered icebreakers. Here's a look. The search for the elusive Northwest Passage over Canada began 500 years ago, and it claimed the lives of thousands of mariners due to the extreme conditions and ice-covered sea. It's still not really a viable route, but an alternative passage across the top of Russia looks much more promising. And thanks to rising global temperatures, it's becoming increasingly viable. The Northeast Passage connects China and East Asia to Northern Europe, it reduces the sailing distance significantly compared to the Suez Canal route. This part of the passage, known as the Northern Sea Route, is controlled by Russia. Melting sea ice due to climate change is making it more accessible for shipping. The latest climate projections predict the Arctic will have its first ice-free summer as early as 2035. And Russia is turning this into a major geopolitical advantage and has already made vast investments in the region. It's built military bases, opened up oil fields, and begun extracting other natural resources. Russia today has a unique, I want to emphasize this, unique fleet, the largest icebreaker fleet in the world. And this is a huge competitive advantage. There are colossal opportunities for the development of logistics industry, the creation of new jobs for the comprehensive development of Arctic cities and towns. The route may also give China a strategic advantage. It could reduce the travel time for Chinese goods to Europe by two weeks, a saving of around $1.8 million per ship. Chinese vessels can also bypass the areas where the US has a huge navy presence. And Houthi attacks on Western ships in the Red Sea have also disrupted shipping through the Suez Canal, which makes alternative routes even more viable. The US, for its part, is wary of the cooperation between China and Russia. To counter the two, last week, Canada, Finland and the US signed a pact to collaborate on the production of icebreakers and other polar capabilities. I think the biggest geopolitical risk is the same kind of supply chain choke point that you see in a lot of other industries, where if the capability to build these atrophies in the West and a country that does not share our interests or our vision for the world corners the market and they have got leverage on us that is undue but not just on us, the United States, but democratic nations around the world. Last year, more than 36 million tonnes of goods were transferred through the Northern Sea Route, but the number for the Suez Canal stood at 1.6 billion tonnes. The Northern Sea Route presents a promising future, but the environmental limits and complicated geopolitical issues could determine how much of it will become a reality. So could the Silk Road on ice bypass the geopolitics to become a profitable shipping route in the near future? Well, joining me now to debate that and more are from London, China strategist Andrew Lung. From Moscow, political analyst with the Center for Actual Politics think tank, Viktor Olievich. And in the British capital also, fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, Maximilian Hess. Uh, thanks all so much for being with me. Andrew Lung, I'll start with you and let's look at China. How much does developing this passageway mean to China? And, and how much does Beijing really envision a partnership with Moscow to make it happen? Well, the Bowen Road, um, the Arctic uh, Silk Road, uh, is part and parcel uh, of China's massive uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, wanting to connect, connect 
the rest of the world to China uh, economically, uh, through trade, uh, through investments, uh, through um, transport connectivity. Um, and uh, the importance of the Arctic Seal Road is that it would cut short the transportation time uh, or the uh, the passage time for goods and 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 even a certain extent of services, um, in um, as opposed to passage through the Suez Canal, it is at least. 40% shorter. So economically, it's, it's extremely uh, important uh, for um, the businesses and for trade connectivity uh, with a lot of host countries. Um, now, secondly, uh, of course, the, the Arctic uh, doesn't belong to any single country. And China is not has got no uh, territorial claim over the Arctic. But nevertheless, because the Arctic resources don't belong to any country. A lot of the resources belong to the whole world. And so China has earned a, um, the, the status as a permanent observer uh, on the Arctic Council, um, uh, through which is playing a very a proactive role um, in, in uh, the governance uh, over the Arctic. And of course, China's partnership with Russia, because they are both pushed together rather than being attracted together uh, by Americans' uh, aggression against both countries. So mm. I think that there's all these uh, four uh, uh, dimensions um, have a role to play um, in the uh, importance uh, of the Arctic uh, Silk okay. Road to I mean, China. It's, it's interesting to see, though, how that Russia-China partnership will develop, because it seems Russia does believe it has some ownership over this waterway. So, Victor, really same question for you then from Moscow's perspective. And, and how much does Russia need China to make this shipping route worthwhile? And does Russia believe it actually owns this waterway? Because if it doesn't, how else is it going to profit here? Well, the Arctic uh, Silk Passage is beneficial to both China and Russia. Uh, as my colleague just said, it is economically profitable. The route from Shanghai to Hamburg in Germany, for example, takes 35 days uh, through the Suez Canal and only 18 days through the Arctic Passage. That's a very, very significant um, economic uh, profit for both, uh, logis for both uh, uh, countries. Uh, Russia as a transit uh, country and China as, as uh, an exporter of goods to, uh, to Europe. Secondly, there is a geopolitical aspect. Uh, the, uh, the situation, the geopolitical situation in the South China Sea is not the easiest for China and may get more difficult uh, with time. China may get uh, challenged by a number of powers in the South China Sea, supported by the United States uh, and its allies. And so that may make alternative uh, routes to, uh, to Europe uh, through the South more difficult and more expensive. Sure. But Russia more still risky would want to... In some ways for, for China. Yeah, Russia would still want to be able to profit. Uh, from from giving China this advantage of not having to root China. So how does Russia see that of happening course. if China is pretty pretty intent on keeping these shipping lanes completely international? Well, China would have to, if uh, China and Russia cooperate uh, closely on the uh, Arctic uh, shipping lanes, China would have to rely on Russia's port infrastructure. China would have to rely on Russia's icebreaker fleets. Uh, Russia today is the largest uh, uh, icebreaker uh, state in the world. Uh, China would have to rely on Russia's northern regions uh, for its logistical uh, lanes. There are several uh, ways that China's goods may reach, can reach Europe through Russia. First is the uh, sea lane uh, route uh, in the Arctic Ocean. The other way, which is also very profitable, both for China and for Russia, is a combined uh, way with uh, using Russia's railroads and uh, Russia's uh, northern sea passage. So China's goods can travel through using Russia's uh, vast railway system through Mongolia, mm. to Russia, through Russia's territory, okay. to 
the uh, warm sea seawater port of Arkhangelsk okay. in the northwest uh, of Russia, and from there to Europe. Okay, let me and get, let also, me get to... And also, I should mention that Russia... Mm -hmm. I need to get to Max, uh, because Max, I mean, both of our panelists, maybe more so from Russia, envision quite a partnership here. Uh, obviously not just in the sea lanes, but uh, across land as well. I saw you kind of smirk at the fact that uh, the, our Russian panelists would think the partnership would go that far. I'm wondering why uh, it would seem kind of silly. Well, uh, my smirking specifically was uh, with relation to the Russian rail infrastructure. Russia has had this idea of boosting uh, its position as a rail transport corridor for China-European trade uh, for many years now. Uh, of course, since Vladimir Putin unilaterally invaded Ukraine in the full-scale invasion in February of 2022, uh, that is a complete uh, non-starter. Europe will just simply not engage in that trade and is working on alternative plans in which China is quite interested through the middle corridor. The amount of trade that actually actually goes via rail in Russia right now uh, annually is something like the equivalent of one container ship. Okay. Now, uh the real reality here, though, is it is China that controls the future, not only of um, the specific development of the Arctic shipping routes and how uh, Russia is involved in that, but Russia's economic future more broadly because of how much Vladimir Putin has weakened that country by his decision to invade uh, and welcome the full scale of sanctions that Russia has been uh, suffering under ever since. Okay, but I mean, many Max foresee those sanctions being lessened at some point. So let me ask you if you think the U.S. should be worried here, because does all of this add? to the global polarization that many see uh, with different axes forming uh, so that the economies of the so-called global south uh, can eventually be less dependent on the U.S. altogether and use this China-Russia relationship as a way to navigate around having to deal with the U.S. Uh, and any of its power access at all. So the short answer is no. Uh, Chinese institutions set up in the Belt and Road um, that in some ways are key challengers to the Western-led economic order uh, have uh, still had to comply with sanctions on Russia or still bent themselves to doing so. We see that with, for example, the New Development Bank, once known as the BRICS Bank, suspending its loans in Russia following the imposition of sanctions in uh, 2022. Uh, secondly, the um, you know real truth of the matter is, is that despite some of of the rhetoric, including in the West, about China and Russia being so aligned, Vladimir Putin wants three things from China. He wants a deal on the power of Siberia 2 gas pipeline. He wants direct support for his uh, wanton invasion and destruction of Ukrainian territory and Ukrainian people. And third, he wants Chinese access to Chinese financial markets and support and development there. Things like the Arctic route are a fourth request, potentially. China has not given Putin any of those three things almost two and a half years uh, into the full-scale invasion. So I am critical of some of the Western rhetoric that lumps Beijing uh, and Russia in together, but it is very clear that Beijing is the senior partner in that relationship and that it is not willing to give Putin everything that um, uh, he wants or anywhere near that. That may, of course, okay. change if the West uh, weakens itself, but so far um, China has been remarkably consistent there. Andrew, would you agree with that analysis of the state right now, and do you think it will change? Well, um, to a certain extent, I agree, um, because uh, China doesn't rely on uh, Russia uh, as much as Russia relies on China. But, but then, as far as, as the Belt and Road is concerned, uh, it doesn't depend entirely on the Arctic route, uh, because the uh, don't forget that there is the Maritime Silk Road, and it connects to the so-called um, uh, overland economic belt across the Europe and connecting um, Western Europe uh, with China uh, by rail. So a lot of goods are passing through rail lines and also the importance of pipelines and ra railway lines um, across the uh, continental Europe uh, or Eurasia. It's also very important, and it doesn't have to um, rely on the Arctic, apart from the fact that the Arctic is, is not totally navigable. Uh, Victor, final question for you then. Uh, you know, Russia really wants to increase trade by about tenfold um, through the northern coast, through, the, through this uh, northeast passage, in the next 10 years is what the, the stated goal is. Is it really possible? Look, the West has made a fundamental mistake of pushing uh, two world powers at the same time, China and Russia. And of course, that push, that simultaneous pressure 
uh, that's being applied against Moscow, more so against Moscow right now, somewhat less so against Beijing, is what, as has been said before, is what's pushing the two countries together. So the skeptical predictions about Chinese involvement with Russia or Chinese initiatives, uh, economic uh, cooperation with Russia that have been made are based on what is happening right now. But uh, this will change if the pressure is be if the West keeps pressuring China more, China will cooperate with Russia more and China will have much less incentive uh, to limit or curtail its financial, economic, industrial and other types of cooperation with Russia. And at this point, we see that both possible coming administrations in the United States, for example, whether Biden and Kamala Harris or another Democratic uh, leader, if Biden is replaced, uh, comes into the White House next January, or whether it's Trump and Vance, both are very much set on anti-Chinese course. And if the United States continues to pressure China and make that pressure, increase that pressure, China is going to be bound on closer cooperation with Russia, including on the Arctic passage, including on railway construction in Russia, including on investments in Russia's Far East, in Russia's South Siberian region, and the Far North. So okay. if that doesn't look probable right now, if the Western policy doesn't change, that will look much more probable in the coming years. Yeah, Max, a uh, quick final word on that then, because, I mean, many, I shouldn't say many, but there are some that are really predicting a Trump win in the presidency could not only push Russia and China closer together, but other would rather be adversaries of the United States into, into an even stronger alliance that will benefit Russia and China inadvertently. Do you agree? Uh, I certainly think uh, that there is a risk there, and I take on uh, with advisement both of the other panelists' comments about uh, the fact that the U.S. is essentially trying to uh, compete in this economic war with both sides at the same time. For me, I think the priority is quite obviously the threat that Russia faces, uh, uh, Russia poses with its ongoing war, with its uh, bellicose nuclear rhetoric, and I think that the West sometimes uh, sees China as too aggressive. China does not, has not have the same track record of invading its neighbors um, that Russia does. That being said, I'd also point back to Andrew's comments about reliance and dependency, and it very much goes one way from Russia towards China rather than the other. Russia may be the world's largest energy exporter and China the world's largest importer, but Beijing has options in the Middle East. It has options in Central Asia. It's helping to build out the middle corridor through Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Caspian, Azerbaijan, Georgia, on to Europe. Uh, China is in no way required to turn to Russia there. And of course, for a uh, extremely bellicose administration, one that is riddled with uh, ultra-nationalists in Russia and where anti-Chinese racism is extremely common, uh, the Russian body politic also won't support uh, a sort of long-term dependency on China. And I think Beijing is much more aware of that than we are in the West as well. Okay, Victor, I can see you disagree, but so unfortunately, uh, we're out of time. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us uh, on this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank our viewers, of course, for being with us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X, and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.